everybody. My name is Matt Richling. I'm this year's YPN vice chair. Um, Marissa couldn't be here today, so I've taken the reins and I'm going to moderate today's panel of awesome speakers talking about working with home time, uh, first time home sellers. So let's get everyone to turn their cameras on um, and I'm going to get everyone to introduce themselves. So first we have Kelsey. Kelsey, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from? Hey, thanks, Matt. Um, I'm Kelsey Belouz. I'm from Thunder Bay, and I've been in the business. Next week will be my 13th calendar year, so I'm excited to be here. That's super exciting. <laughs> Ashley, let's, let's tell us all about yourself. Sure. Um, yeah, I've been in the business for a while as well. I think it's about 13 to 15 years. I can't keep track, um, but I'm a Toronto realtor with the Toronto Real Estate Board. Excellent. Our, our, our Guelph friend, come on, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, everyone. My name is Georgia Laverini. I am primarily in Guelph and I am a newer agent. I actually started this year. Um, so hopefully it can bring some insight to the newer people watching. Justin. Hey, everyone. I'm Justin Bach. Uh, I work up here in the uh, Collingwood and Blue Mountain area, and I've been a realtor, uh, actually just uh, celebrated my ninth year in the industry. So. so we've got a lot of experience here. This isn't, um, you know, this is hopefully will be really helpful for everybody. So, Ashley, why don't you get us started? Um, there seems to be a lot of focus on working with first time home buyers, and we, we, we covered that in an episode last year. But what are some of the differences between buying and selling that are really important to consider when working with clients selling their first property? Um, I feel like there's a lot of similarities, but also differences. The similarities being that, you know, it's about educating the client. And so when it comes to first time home buyers, you're educating them on the process. Um, and similarly, on the first time home seller side as well, it's also about the process, but it's a, a lot different. So for example, preparing their place for sale, I feel like oftentimes with first time home sellers, they kind of underestimate how long it takes to prepare a home for sale. You know, when you tell them to declare, they're like, yeah, I can do it in a weekend. But um, in reality, it also it always takes longer. And so uh, I usually add a little bit of a buffer whenever we uh, we chat about the timelines. Um, and then also, I mean, we won't talk about rates, but in terms of commission, you know, that's an extra factor when it comes to buying. Um, you know, it's sort of like a free service for a buyer. But from a seller's perspective, they're paying the commission on both ends now. And so it's just educating them on on how that works. And, and that's probably something that's completely new for them as well. Georgia, anything yeah, to so, add? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us know that we have to have those tough conversations with sellers and buyers, um, but I find that with first-time home sellers, um, having those crucial conversations from the get-go um, and keeping their expectations where they should be is, is vital. Um, you know, with the market changing constantly, trends, you know, stats and everything are all over the place. Um, you really need to, to stay on top of that with them, whether that's having weekly meetings, you know, every other day having a phone call, depending on, you know, what your clients are looking for. So definitely giving them in-depth feedback throughout uh, more often than probably a buyer um but yeah keeping them keeping them informed Elsie I just bring it back to like myself in my first listing that I sold personally as a realtor so not my personal residence but as a client I was so excited um to be the agent on the first listing that I had and I try to remember that that's the emotions that they are all feeling when they're selling their homes too. And there's a lot of highs and lows and excitement. And I do notice first time home sellers are my favorite or people selling their homes that are new to the specific market. Everything can be different in different cities and different things. And I think it's a big thing, like everyone's saying, to just educate them. And I know people can get overexcited sometimes, and it's our job to be there and kind of be their hub, whether it be their punching bag, their, their, their shrink or whatever. We just always have to be there for everything. And timelines, like Ashley said, are super important because everybody does think it can just happen like this. So it's very important to rein people in and give them the reality of the situation 
because in the long run, they're going to appreciate it and they're going to be pleasantly surprised when their home does sell. Yeah, I think, oh, sorry, I was just no. going to say to add to Kelsey, um, I agree with them. It's such an emotional process for a seller, especially when it's their first home that, you know, it's definitely your job to keep them on track and to take the emotion out of it, especially in a market that we're having now where it's not always bidding wars. You know, sometimes people will be offended if it's a, you know, like a lower offer or whatnot. And so it's definitely our job to be that person to say, okay, like, let's look at this objectively and um, make sure that uh, their emotions are kind of intact as well. Yeah, the worst thing is, is going into a listing that you went on three or four months ago and you're like, yeah, we're going to set it up for multiple offers and this and that. And then they call you back and they're like, but you said this. And I say, okay, but we're going to take it back. Have you been reading what's going on in the news? And now it's our turn to educate that and make them aware, not disappointed, but make them have a different outlook on it when we're going into the listing. Can, can you dive a little bit deeper into that? So, you know, you, you kind of mentioned diving a little bit deeper and explaining a few more things to them uh, in, in someone in a situation like that. Let's, let's just go down that path, right? Okay. We've all, I think we've all right now been there where we've, we've talked to someone six months ago and life's a little bit different right now what can we can we and we're gonna we, we haven't forgot, forgotten about you justin but can we can we kind of kelsey start us off with some of the the data points or market numbers or what else what are we what are we going to use to kind of really help them understand what's going on so prime example is I ha I'm going live on a listing today that I started with them six months ago. And when I told them a price, I said, and we're going to set it up for multiple offers. We're going to, you know, get some staging and we're going to do A, B, C, and D. And this is how my marketing plan goes. And so they were all gung ho on that and they don't live in Thunder Bay. So they're not living the reality of how our market is. They're an out of town seller. And this is their first home that they're selling. So I went and I said to them, listen, I said, our market has shifted a little bit. So I've been shifting my listing strategies. So instead of say, looking at offers on a specific date, we can shift it and say, you know what, we want to allow 72 hours irrevocable for you to decide on an offer. Because if you're looking at offers on a certain date, people can all of a sudden be like, oh, there's no other offers. I'm going to go way lower. Whereas opposed to if day one, they love it, their chances are they're going to offer higher. And when I go and I go through this whole pattern of what people's emotions are and how they would feel and tell them as a seller to think about how a buyer would be feeling in this market, their, their aha moment kind of happens and it clicks. And then they kind of reason with me and they're like, no, what you're saying makes sense. And it's just a matter of consistently proving to them that you're doing the research like nonstop. And when you go and you say to them, no, I'm doing my job behind the scenes. I'm consistently watching what other listings are doing and how we're going to make yours stand out. They really appreciate it. And for the most part, like these people that I'm listing today, they're like, we're so thankful to have you because of the education you've brought with us. And, you know, it makes me feel good to know that I still, after all, like thir 13 years, I am able to give them that insight that they trust, which is a good feeling. Ashley, Justin, Georgia, anything else to add? Basically, right, reminding like, uh, what kind of data points or what kind of information do you guys like to go to or what, what, any tricks or kind of tips about a client that you maybe chatted with six months ago? Yeah, I think for, for me, I really like having something tangible, like provables. Um, and I know Kelsey got into some stuff quite a bit, um, but sending them like property performance reports um, where you show them like, you know, numbers, Facebook ad, um, results, um, you know, your matrix and everything kind of in your MLS system. So something for them to actually see and go through is really, really important. Um, showing them comparables as things, as we talked about, constantly change. So new things coming up on the market um, could drastically impact what you have their house priced at and so on and so forth. So in those weekly conversations or daily or however, you know, you want to have them, um, giving them something as well. So they, you know, and go back and kind of compare over time. Um, I think that that's probably a really good strategy as well. 
I also think that, um, for example, in Toronto, we're, we're about 34% less um, transactions compared to last year. And so most people these days are sold on it, but, you know, talking about the importance of staging and, and all of that, um, because there's less transactions, you really want to make sure that, you know, your listing shines compared to the other ones. And so just doing a lot of um, prep work and educating them on, you know, how, again, the timeline with staging, how it works. Um, but most people, I think, find that, you know, they're, they're pretty sold on staging these days as well, though. Justin, we're going to, we're going to ask the next question to you. Um, what's, what's the difference or how do you approach a, a first time seller versus someone who's maybe sold a property before? Or, or maybe can you start us off with like, if there's maybe a misconception from an agent's point of view? Well, I think, um, so I, I have a little bit of a different sort of, well, not a different spin on it, but I think that like in my markets that I've always worked in, I've worked with a lot of um, uh, sellers who bought directly from a builder. I don't know what it's like in a lot of your market. I just know it's very different in Toronto, but a lot like in the, in the suburbs, like in Oakville, where I was working before and now we're up here in Collingwood, Blue Mountain, a lot of the, um, a lot of the builders up here don't cooperate with agents. So we're not like, so a lot of these sellers that you're coming that you're dealing with for the first time have never even they've never seen a rea forms they've never talked to an agent they don't know any of the jargon they don't know like there's just absolutely zero experience of sort of dealing with anybody from our from our industry um so i think that def, you know that is sort of definitely brought on i guess i mean a good ch as a challenge but also like it's kind of good because they don't have any preconceived notions of like maybe bad experience in the past or anything like that um but that's definitely been uh you know that's definitely been um sort of an interesting situation because they, they just like they've looked, literally have never been part of um sort of part of that world before so it's a lot of um you know it's a lot of education pieces as it's already been sort of mentioned or whatever and really going through that process and i feel um you know when i haven't made um like a very thorough seller's guide but my buyer's guide um you know i made from basically when i had this one client that i had so much email correspondence back with so many of their questions so much of their feedback that i basically pretty much took that whole entire correspondence and threw it in and made you know a buyer's guide out of that and it really though there was like an insane amount of content it was the beginning of covid and there's so many, and the person who i was talking to you know we had nothing about time to you know uh chat back and forth and uh email um for days on end but uh but yeah i think that's like you know there there's like they're gonna have so much questions about like what that process looks like and i think is like there's more as detailed as you can sort of manage their expectations um you know of like of what of what the first time you meet them till the day it gets listed to getting feedback to getting an offer and and closing day and as transparent as you can make that process to them um that's what's gonna really i mean always do that but like especially with first-time sellers and especially with the ones who bought from a builder um that have literally have never uh you know have never done anything with the real estate agent before I um, actually had a, a seller um, last week and um, when they purchased, they, you know, it, it was a bidding war and so there's no conditions or nothing. And so when we received an offer, um, there it was conditional upon home inspection and financing. And so they were kind of confused because they had never gone through that process before. And so I had to educate them on what that meant for the financing condition and the home inspection condition, because they had never seen that before. We weren't in a market where they, you know, um, an, a condition was even an option. And so, and so I, I, I thought that that was interesting needing to explain all of that. And, and also just uh, alleviating any worries. Cause they were like, well, what happens then if, if they back out and, um, and I was just telling them, you know, obviously that this is something that's quite standard. Um, but, but I thought that was kind of an interesting with how the market has shifted a little. You know, it's, it's interesting. I find that with, especially compared to uh, a first time home seller, we, we often have to remind ourselves with someone who's been through the process before still that we have to do our job and we still have to explain things. Right. Is there anything else that we, that we as agents have to remind ourselves for a first time seller or not that, that, that sometimes we forget, is there anything, anyone else want to jump in? 
Um, I just think the education, whether you're a first time seller or you haven't sold a home in 30 years, I met with some people the other day and it was the longest listing presentation I had and they hadn't sold a house in 35 years. And they're like, okay, we had a really bad experience 35 years ago and this is how it went. And I said, well, I can promise you it's not going to go that way. And I sat there and I explained step by step. I said, this is what our market did. This is what it's doing now. And they felt so comfortable and trusted after and they're like this is like we're selling our first home again and I think sometimes we forget that when we're all running and busy and oh they've already they own this house this is their third home but if it hasn't been for 5 10 15 20 years you got to remember and bring it back to the basics for everybody yeah I definitely agree with that I think patience is key here um, being patient with your sellers and walking them through every single step. Um, I think sometimes we as agents may forget, you know, about the paperwork and how complicated that can be to some people. To us, it's common and we understand how to do it really quickly. Um, but sitting there and walking them through that, I find clauses can get really complicated, um, but being like making sure you're really running through every single thing with them and having that patience. Um, something we have in our brokerage are plain language forms, um, which talk to your broker of record. I'm sure most of you can probably find them, um, but they kind of state everything in plain, simple language. And you can kind of give that to them and walk through it step by step or you know, let them go at their own pace when they can read it on their own. So that's also just kind of another thing um, that you can do to give them some ease. <laughs> A few of you have mentioned managing expectations through the process. Um, what are some of the tips or tools or systems that you, you guys have found best to help manage with that, especially in maybe a not so hot market or, or a changing market? Uh, one thing that, uh, that I found was worked really well um, as part of my um, listing process is when the property goes on the market, I we like we have an email that go basically goes out says you know congratulations your property is listed you know and basically you know and it and it point forms like kind of everything that we've talked about to that point so when like you know the fact that you know rare, rarely do we get feedback but if we do get feedback it'll be communicated the next morning Monday mornings are when you're going to get a market update from like you know obviously open any time, but like Mondays, you will definitely get a market update with me to let you know what sold over the past weekend, you know, what price reductions, what new properties have come to market, anything that we sort of need to pivot um, and sort of just really spell out um, those expectations. And I found that that really works just because, you know, uh, you know, there's information overload during the whole process. I mean, period. Um, but especially there's so much information coming at the sellers leading up to like the list date that, you know, I find that like, it's just a really good time to, you know, just sort of begin re-up the um, um what the expectations are and sort of managing like when they ex can expect to hear from me for a particular items so that way like the second that a showing isn't over i'm not getting bombarded with like have you heard any feedback yet well they i'm sure they haven't even locked the front door yet you know what i mean so it's really good just sort of a, i find that that has been really really helpful for me to be able to communicate that to my clients and say hey like this is exactly when you're gonna hear from me. This is exactly when I'm gonna provide you information. And here's also like, you know, a copy of your listing agreement, a copy of the MLS, a copy of the marketing that we have already set up and, you know, have like screenshots of any of the Facebook and Instagram campaigns. So that they are like 100% like aware of exactly the process that's happening right now. I think in addition to that as well, that was kind of a, a lot of stuff we I'm sure we would all touch on, um, but but make sure you you view properties as well. So comparable listings in the area, um, things that, you know, you think are going to sell. I think it's important for you to know exactly kind of what, you know, you're up against and everything going on in the market so you can give them a true snapshot um, and say, I saw this, you know, they have a nicer kitchen or a nicer bathroom and their price is lower, right? So being able to shift that conversation. Um, and I think feedback is super important as well. Um, I know a lot, it's it's hard to get feedback uh, from some agents, but, but keep on it, um, keep calling them. People will provide it to you if you really need it. Um, and yeah, and just kind of, it, it's easier to say it from someone else's um, words than it is from yours sometimes. Um, and they want kind of different feedback from other people. So I think that's also a good, a good way to set their expectations. 
Kelsey, earlier you mentioned seller's emotions and having to bear the brunt of the negativity as an agent. How do you deal with that personally? Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's all different types of people out there, right? So sometimes your ideal seller is going to be the happiest one who preaches the choir to everybody and says they can't deal with anybody but you. But in all reality, you are getting some high stress situations where maybe financially they can't afford their home anymore, or they're separating from their partner, or, you know, life is bringing them elsewhere. And we just have to remember that sometimes the emotions that they're feeling and directing towards us, we just have to validate them and say, I understand understand or even just going to the point where being a first time home seller they haven't experienced this reaching out to them every day or two if especially if there's a ton of showings and saying you know how are you guys feeling about this whole thing is there anything i can do better to make this smoother um is there anything you are happy with or unhappy with just having that open dialogue to i feel like it makes them feel a lot less stressed in an even more stressful situation um and another thing too is like the divorce rates are kind of getting high because of covid so lots of people are going to be dealing with people who are it's a husband and wife or a partner separating and you know you have to remember not to focus on just one and you focus on both make you know are you on good terms can we start a group chat can you know can I update whoever who's allowed to know this and not and you just want to make everybody feel as comfortable as possible so that that stress doesn't completely come down on you but you also have to remember that if it does come down on you don't let it affect your every day and don't let it affect how you operate with everyone else because you just take your deep breaths and it will get better and just remember like just always try and remember that they're we don't know exactly what they're dealing with on the other end um but for the most part if you you validate their feelings i think everybody will feel a lot better about most situations when they're selling in stressful situations yeah we we, we get the brunt of it often right uh and, and people forget that we're human too um we're not just uh you know an expense to them. Um, Ashley, you're, you're, you're in Toronto. Um, today's, they're going to be another rate announcement. How do you find with the media? This is actually a question from uh, Nelson. How, how are you handling a lot of the negative mainstream media with the sellers? Um, I think it's, reading the articles and, and knowing what the media is saying, but then also adding some context around it as well, because oftentimes what we're hearing is maybe Canada wide or it's Ontario wide and not necessarily related to the specific pockets that we're in. Um, for example, even in Toronto, you know, it's very neighborhood specific or even specific to condos or houses. And so um, giving them some context in terms of what you're seeing on the ground, how, you know, the types of showings that we're having, the types of activities that we're actually having, uh, instead of what we're hearing specifically from the news really helps um, with, you know, talking to the client and helping them understand that it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. Um, because I mean, really, and, and just reminding them that a lot of times, you know, with the media, it's like, you, you know, they need to make headlines. Um, but sometimes in reality, it's not necessarily the case. Um, so I think that's a lot of it. It's a lot of communication. Perfect. Do, do you guys find that seller expectations differ based on whether it's the first time selling a property or not? I'd open that up to everyone. I feel like when they've sold something before and whether they've had a good experience or a bad experience, um, I definitely think that that can kind of make them a little bit more jaded and of like, I feel like those expectations are definitely higher. Um, you know, I think that with first time sellers, like they don't like, you know, kind of what we've all been saying is that they don't necessarily know what to expect. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I think that one, you know, this is the first time them, uh, them paying commission checks. So I feel, you know, they are also, you know, very aware of, you know, wanting to feel like they got, you know, appropriate value for, you know, the money that they've spent, you know, a lot of people, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're giving a big chunk of their, um, you know, of, of their profit, um, especially in this market too, when they thought that they were going to make that much more, um, you know, it's definitely, um, really important, uh, you know, to, that we're providing that value, but I definitely think that, you know, that they 
while they maybe don't necessarily know what expectation to have, first time sellers definitely are very aware of that commission check that they're they're writing. Yeah, I definitely agree with Justin. And I think constantly assessing, um, you know, where their expectations are sometimes in the beginning, you know, they want to be really informed. Um, and then if a house is sitting on the market for quite some time, see if you can, you know, pull off a little bit depending on what they're looking for. Um, I think you should always start, um, you know, setting the same expectations, whether they've sold a home before or they haven't, um, always giving, you know, everyone the same kind of level of service. Um, and then, you know, you can assess later on. I think that that's important and it's, it's really dependent on your client. Kelsey, any thoughts? Oh, a lot. So <laughs> I think it's going to be important to realize too in this market that your house doesn't go up for sale and it sells right away and things like that. And I think for the last few years, everyone's had that expectation. Um, what I think we're going to see a lot is listings expiring and they're going to be hiring other agents. We also have to remember that they hired another realtor for a reason. So if we're going to that point where they're relisting their first property, we have to ask them and be mindful, what weren't you happy about with your first experience? And what were you told versus what were you expecting? Um, and then almost focus on those things, not fully, but to an extent, just to make their experience a little better. Because it, again, it isn't as easy as just, oh, for sale, sold anymore. We have to we have to actually put the work in and it's the people who are going to put that work in and, and keep on their clients are those are the ones that are going to excel in a changing market like this. And it's important to remember that. Can you, can you just repeat that? So if I'm an agent who maybe I haven't done an expired listing before, yep. uh, or I, haven't, I haven't taken one on, what, what should I be doing? What should I be focused on when I'm going into that kind of first meeting? So first things first is try and completely forget that the house wasn't listed or was listed. Um, don't go based on what their list price was because chances are that's one of the reasons why the home wasn't sold. Um, do your research in the background. Look at how they photographed your home. Look at their ads, everything like that. And almost don't even directly say it to them. Just say, okay, well, I read your old ad, but here, what do you think of this one? And bring that on your listing presentation and make it shine. Um, bring examples of how you stage or photograph listings um, as opposed to, oh, you had a really bad experience with this, so I don't do that, but show them. Bring that proof, and when you show them um, how much better they will be dealing with you, um, they're going to already feel that sense of relief. And um, I know, yeah, like you said, people haven't really dealt with expired listings being re listed in a long time and and it is starting to happen now and you just have to try and remind the client that to wash everything out that has happened whether it positive or negative because they're hiring you because it's going to be a completely different experience Ashley do you change the way that you you interact with a seller when it's an expired you know especially maybe if it's a first time seller but do you, do you change the way that you interact with them? Um, definitely, I think a little bit more patient with them because oftentimes if they have an expired listing, they probably didn't have a necessarily great experience. And so just reassuring them that, you know, your, your experience with them will be completely different and just making sure that um, they're not so because sometimes I you know people are very hesitant with even relisting like sometimes they just say oh I don't want to sell anymore because it was such a bad experience and so just having a lot of patience and understanding um, and just being there to support them and, and hearing out what it was that concerned them I think goes a long way. I was going to say something that uh, we do in our listing presentation kind of right off the bat um, is ask the question like, have you had an experience with a past realtor? What did you like and what didn't you like um, and why, right? And kind of get them talking about, you know, maybe they didn't get enough information from them. Maybe, you know, they overpriced their house. Like what is that gap? And then talk about how you can fill it, right? And, and really, really just ask that question right at the beginning. Um, I find that that's extremely helpful when working with, with sellers. You mentioned asking questions. Does anyone ask a bunch of questions 
and not just, you know, how big is your home, whatever, but you ask any questions about their expectations before you even attend their meeting. So I see a bunch of nodding heads. What, what are those questions? One of the biggest pieces of advice actually that I got like about four or five years ago that has totally changed my listing presentations is literally asking the question, what is most important for you during this transaction period and what what stresses you out the most and what scares you most about this process and if you sit and if you just ask those you know three questions take a sit back and listen to everything that they're saying you're going to be able to build your whole entire the rest of the listing presentation out from hearing that but you're also going to be able to speak to exactly the things that are important to them to that process you'll hear what their expectations are you're going to hear what their um you know what they're scared and what's what they're stressed about you know like you know and that really worked especially you know during the beginning of covid you know you know there i I remember asking that question and you know it was you know she was terrified of basically like it was an investment it was a secondary home for them so like a cottage property and they were like you know after all those people are through my house i'm so scared to basically you know come back and you know have so much germs in my house because at a time of you know we think we had like over 60 showings on that property um before offer night and so you know it, it was a very simple hey i normally send my cleaning person to come and clean your property before closing like so that you don't have to but what if i brought that cleaning person before you guys come back up and enjoy your family cottage and all of a sudden you you could literally just see the weight of her shoulders just like drop and be like wow that would actually be you know such an amazing thing that it would totally de-stress our situation so you know had i not asked that question i would not have known that barrier that i sort of needed to break down and that was you know that was a really fantastic um you know piece for me to be able to you know to offer that something that i would normally do at a later date but i just offered to you know, basically move that forward for her. Anyone else? Specific questions that you ask before even attending, you know, uh, a listing appointment. I always ask them if there's things they need to do before the house goes up for sale. Um, So I kind of have an expectation of when I'm going in or I ask them, say like, have you done any specific cosmetic improvements that would make your house stand out from the others? Because when I ask that question, because when I go in, I've at least looked at my comparables that are kind of similar. And then I also get my idea of what they think are important features in their home uh, that they're proud of. So then I can try and focus on them. And another thing too, that lots of people don't realize is that, um, they think their homes are ready to show as they sit and lots of realtors can get caught in oh I just want a listing I want it and they don't actually go and take the extra step and say okay your listing looks great like this but hey can we move this here or you know do you mind if I get my painter in here to do some touch-ups little things like that where you're not insulting them but you're just trying to show them that's going to make their listing stand out and excel Um, and having that like book of people who are at your disposal to help your clients. I feel like it goes a long way. And most people don't realize that you can help with that stuff. And it could make people a difference of 10, 15, 20,000 or more dollars by just putting an extra five to a hundred or 500 to a thousand dollars worth of investment more into their property. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to ask everybody, what are the top three questions that sellers are asking you right now? The top three questions, you know, at any point, what are the top three questions the sellers are asking you right now? Ashley, I'll let you start it off. Um, Well, the first one is how's the market, (laughs) definitely. And what do you expect the market? Um, That's probably the question I get the most in terms of, is this a good time to sell? Um, Another one is also, should I buy before I sell or vice versa? And so, you know, that obviously changes with the changing market. Um, But just understanding also what the seller's um, motivations are like, do they have to move? What's the reason why they're moving? Um, Why are they wanting to sell? And so having that conversation, I think, um, is quite important. But that's probably the top two. I'm trying to think of a third, though. (laughs) Justin, you, you can come back. We'll come back. I probably don't have three, but I, like I, the one that I literally feel like a broken record that I keep answering over and over and over again, especially the last few weeks, is when should I list? You know, when's the best time to list? And I think that that yeah, that's definitely 
um, the top one like resounding question that I keep uh, that I keep getting. What what's your advice for answering the question? I'm sure that every every place is maybe different or every answer is different, possibly. But how, can you just dig a little bit deeper into that? Yeah. So I mean, you know, I think that we like. Um, for the last two years, we haven't really followed any like sort of normal market cycles that we would normally see fall market, spring market, et cetera. Um, there's been, you know, everything's been a little bit um, wonky that way. So, you know, I think that anybody who's sort of been watching the market the last year just sees, oh, you can throw your house up on the, on Labor Day weekend and it's going to get multiple offers by Monday where, you know, we've really, since the rates have started going up this year, I think that we've sort of started to see a normal like a normal um, cycles in the market. Um, we've yet to see what's going to happen in the fall market. And that's kind of, you know, what my answer sort of been um, historically up here in Collingwood and Blue Mountain, nothing, not a lot of volume and transaction happens in summer, especially in August, because, you know, the people that are buying the ski properties are, you know, at their cottage over the summer. They're not thinking about that. You know, they get back into the city, you know, get their kids back to school and not sort of like when their mind switches to, hey, like winter is going to be here in three months. Like, what are we doing? Are we renting? Are we buying? sort of like, what is our sort of, what, what are our plans? Um, so that's sort of been like my answer that is like, okay, like let's forget the last two years. Let's go back to historical data and like watch when a lot of market, markets flood the market, when they usually sell and sort of what this like, you know, historical timeline is, right? So for us starting to get properties prepped in the month of September and getting on near the end of September and getting them, you know, be, being able to be closed by the time ski season starts is really, really important in our market traditionally. So that's sort of what my, you know, what my blanket answer has sort of uh, been unless of course there's, you know, extenuating circumstances. I love it. Um, so yeah, let's continue back. Top questions that sellers are asking. I think in addition, I get a lot of market ones as well, but one thing I remembered is, you know, people always ask, how will you sell my house? Um, like, what are you going to do specifically? Um, and that also goes back to setting their expectations from the start, telling them everything that you're going to do, that you're going to offer, how you set their house apart with staging and everything like that. Um, but I think a lot of them think, you know, you're going to bring in an offer and then that's kind of how it goes, but just explaining how the process works. It's like agents will come in, they'll potentially bring people in. This is what I'm going to do to hopefully bring in offers for you. Um, but a lot of the time, yeah, they, they just want you to sell it and, and you just have to show your worth and, but also not give them false hope or false promises as well. Um, so never, I see Chris in the chat saying, you know, what can you say to sellers to assure them that their house will sell? I would say probably try not to say we are hundred percent going to sell your house and give them uh, promises that you may not be able to reach. Um, but reframing that. So they feel comfortable that you are the expert um, and, and hopefully will sell their house. I, I remember an old Buffini line where you walk around the house and you tour it and you take notes and you write down things. Right. And then you sit down at the table and you say, you, th we, this will definitely sell. Right. Every time you're supposed to say that. Right. And so it's, it's, but times have changed. So Kelsey, what, what's one question maybe that you're finding that every seller is asking you right now? What's your commission and is it negotiable? <laughs> so yeah, that's the big thing. Oh, well, my friend did this and their realtor told them this. I said, well, did your realtor do A, B, C, and D? Like, this is what, like, I'm a firm believer and I preach this to everybody. You prove your worth based on your reputation, your experience, your knowledge, and don't let people, you know, back you into a corner, prove what you're worth. And, um, and that's, it's really important. And especially because these first time home sellers are like, oh, well, we can just do it online by ourselves and this and that, because social media is so important. But it's like, do you have the following? Do you have the experience to, to filter these things and the know-how? And I said, how do you feel when somebody says this is bad about your house? Like, do you get defensive or do you have an answer? Oh, no, I don't have an answer, but I do. And that's my job. And, um, or, well, why should I list with you as opposed to privately? That's a big one that I'll be honest, lots of my friends have said to me lately, and I gave them the answers and they actually listed it with me. They had no issues and they were like, we are so glad that we didn't go the private route because you did everything for us. And from me moving boxes in their home to, you know, sweeping their floors, we just have to remember it's 
everything is in our job description, nothing is out of the norm. That kind of got off track a little bit, but I think, <laughs> I think it's kind of important. Yeah. Uh, you, you've all talked about just the amount of preparation that's so key before walking into a listing, right? And we've kind of highlighted that before. Um, but for a new agent, so let's put, pretend we're a brand new agent or we're talking to a brand new agent right now uh, who hasn't had a listing. They haven't, they haven't been down that road. They haven't experienced that yet. What advice would you give them? What would you sit there and, and say, hey, you know what? This is what I would do if I were you. Uh, Justin? Like, you know, if there's an opportunity to have a really good conversation with them prior to getting, um, you know, to sitting down at the table with them at a listing presentation or not, like my biggest piece of advice is like, like ask qualifying questions, not like, you know, are you motivated or anything like that? But again, going back to that, what's important to you pieces, really focus on them. I mean, um, psych psychologically as humans, we love to talk about ourselves. Um, so if you can, you know, if you can ask them a lot of questions, they will be more than happy to answer the things that they love about their house, things that make them proud, the things that are they're nervous about, scared about, whatever it is. And you like, those are all really, really important questions that you can, whether you've done one deal or a hundred, you like, you can speak to those concerns and speak to those things that are important to them, whether you've sold zero houses or a hundred houses, you can make the experience about them. Um, whereas a lot, you know, there's so many coaches out there that are like throwing, like, make sure you bring stats, make sure you bring this, make sure you bring that. Like, and that really, like for me, like when I got in the industry, that scared the heck out of me because I was like, well, I don't have stats. I, well, I don't have a list to sold ratio. I don't have how many days, my average days on the market. I don't have any of that. Like, how am I supposed to sit there as a brand new agent and be at a table competing against, you know, veteran agents that have been in the industry for 10 years that have all these stats prepared. But like, you know, if you can really just focus on making the experience entirely about those sellers and, and, you know, and, and really tailor it to them, then it doesn't matter to me whether you've sold one or a hundred because you like, you're entirely tailoring the process to them. But, but at the same time, I, I think one of the activities that I was once told was go figure out your stats because you might be surprised. Right. And even, even I know maybe as a new agent, you don't have those stats yet, but you might have other stats that can still show some value. And I, even as an experienced agent going through and knowing what your list to sell ratio is, is, you know, if you don't know what that is, right, just being able to know it, it, it does still provide you some value. Uh, but Ashley, what, uh, what would you, you know, you're talking to a brand new agent who hasn't yet landed a listing, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I kind of uh, echo what Justin's saying in terms of understanding what the pain points are for the client and then just being there to support them. I think, you know, a lot of it is knowing the stats and, and you know, performing well, but I think a big part of our job also is the human and the personal factor and giving support. And I think that goes a long way, especially with a first time home seller. It, it's a lot of emotions involved. And I think just keeping them on track and really listening to what they have to say um, helps a lot. Somebody had talked about, um, you know, younger first time home sellers not being phone people. Typically, I like to, um, the, one of the first conversations I like to have with a client is, how do you like to communicate? Are you, do you want to do a phone call? Do you want to, and whatever it is, and I'll try to, I'll try to communicate with you that way, because some people might feel more comfortable doing, you know, in person or, or texting or whatnot. And, and then obviously if something is a really detailed, um, Kind of conversation, then I would set up a call. But if they prefer text, if they prefer email, whatnot, then then I try to accommodate that as well because that's probably the way that they understand easiest. Um, I think going back to kind of where are you going to get the stats from? Um, I'm also a newer agent, so. Um, I am on a team, so I really leverage my team. I bring in my team lead on certain things. So I have that. If you don't, um, and you really are struggling trying to um, go out there and show your worth, leverage your brokerage stats. Um, they have a ton of stats as well. And you can be like, I'm a part of this big brokerage that does X, Y, Z, or you can even bring in another agent, right? Like find an agent that you connect with, co-list, for your first couple of listings until you get comfortable. Um, 
if you really don't think you can do it on your own, you can, um, but that's just kind of another strategy uh, to take if, if you know, you, you're not ready yet, um, because you still get that experience, you can still be the first agent, you can still then gain your stats from there, um, but that that would kind of be my advice because working with someone, obviously, you know, I'm younger, I'm a woman. It's it's always a question: How long have you been in the business? Um, you know, and obviously, it's not very long. So being able to to leverage something, so brokerage stats for sure. Kelsey, I new was, agent. Yeah. Yes. So I always tell um, the new agent starting at my brokerage that find somebody or myself like if they're willing go on the listing appointments with them and listen to them and absorb things like a sponge. And because basically you, you could go on listing appointments with three different realtors and take little tidbits from each one and make it into your own hole. Um, when I first started, I was 19 years old and I'm like, who the heck is going to sell their house with me? I'm 19. I've never bought a house. I've, so and then I'm just like, okay, I'm going to use my brokerage. And that's what I tell everybody. We do have a lot of new agents that come on with our brokerage. And we tell everybody, use the office stats. This is what we do. And we all work like a team together. We don't have a huge brokerage, but we have a tight knit brokerage. And, and so I always say to people, use that to your advantage. And who cares if you've sold no listings before? bring me on. I'll sit there and, or you just assess your situation. So basically you can ask your clients, Hey, are you okay? If I bring my broker of record along with me or another agent, just to make sure that everything is covered. And all of a sudden they go from here to here and they automatically have that little level of security. If they're starting to buck that you're a newer agent. But for the most part, I know I've got, um, I think I have an agent in my office and he's done really well and he's watching right now. Um, he takes everything and he listens and he, his first listing, it was like, a, it was like, he knew what he was doing. He walked in there like a boss, got the multiple offers and worked his butt off. And that's because he listened and he learned um, and took his time to create his own process. And those people never once questioned him at all. There was, a, there was a question that kind of started touching about commission and we're not gonna go there. So instead what we're gonna do is, is uh, can you give us some tips on how we can show our value to a seller? Uh, Ashley. Yeah, um, I think it's definitely knowing what you bring and showing them the value that you bring to the table. So a lot of it is understanding the pain points and then being able to overcome those pain points. If they're afraid of something, if they're worried about the amount of work, where can you add value? And that's where you can show them that you're worth the whatever commission it is. Um, I think also staying organized and being able to keep track for them. Okay, like this is a calendar of what to be expecting. Um, you know, this is our target sell date. This is what we're gonna do in the meantime and just outlining it for them, um, I think goes a long way as well. Justin, yeah. Um, so being up here in Collingwood Blue Mountain, a lot of my clients are secondary homeowners. Um, so a big part of um, that, like one big sort of service that, you know, has really shown my value is like for them to be, you know, completely hands off. I'll go down the city and pick up their key, come back up here, get the staging, get the cleaning, get the photos done completely for them without them ever having to step back up here. And especially as we're doing that over the summertime where they're maybe not up here as much because this is a ski property for them. Like that, you know, that that's a huge, uh, you know, that's a huge value add piece that, uh, you know, that goes a long way for like my seller. So again, understanding those pain points and sort of building your services out to like what makes sense, like in your, in your market specifically, you know, people like that, I, you know, like, if you were someone who sold a lot of condos, as an example, they might not be handy. So for the idea of them, you know, not having, you know, uh, they don't probably don't have a hammer in their house. So a lot of condo owners that I've worked with in the past. So being able to have services that are built out, being like, hey, whatever needs to get done at your property, I have handy guys, you know, or handy women um, that uh, that can go out there and help you uh, get your uh, get your property completely ready for sale without you having to uh, lift a finger and or figure out who I'm going to call to uh, get those things done. Sorry, I just also wanted to add, um, if you're new, 
to, and you don't have that network of people, the handy people, the cleaners and whatnot. Um, I find that I sometimes use Jiffy if, if I'm in, I don't know if it's available in all the markets, but I sometimes use them if I can't find somebody last minute. And so I'll just send over um, someone from Jiffy and, and they'll take care of those items that I need to, to take care of if it's, if it's a little bit minor, even they do cleaning and they have everything, so. Something else as well, I think answering questions before they're asked is really important. If you're finding things are really common throughout working with sellers or buyers, write them down um, so that the next time you can go in and you can kind of just start talking about common questions that are asked, almost like a Q&A, right? And you can even write them out, write down answers um, and give them something and, and just say, you know, these are common questions. Do you have anything else that you want to ask? Um, and, and being that person for them, right? So that could also be another strategy. Anything to add, Kelsey? I think everybody covered kind of what I was thinking too. It, uh, everyone did pretty good on that question. So. so so I'll start the next question with you then. Okay. Uh, so someone asked, and I don't know where the question ran away. Oh, there it is. It's from Nelson. Uh, do you use a two-step listing presentation strategy or do you go for the, the one step? Uh, each one is different. So it's, I always think, I guess everyone is a two or, or three step listing process because your initial interaction, whether it's in person or over the phone, is kind of a step in its own. So if I get a ton of information before I've even gone there and I walk in and the house is impeccable and it's ready to go, then that's kind of been my second step. But sometimes you walk into the house and it might not just be a two-step, it might be a three-step. Or if you got a really busy day, you might have to go back for that second step to measure the house later on or the next day. So I guess with me, it's kind of, I don't know, I do everything differently per listing because Sometimes the day is busy or sometimes those people aren't prepared. So I think it's important in my business anyway, that I kind of wing it and it goes each individual situation is always different for me. Everyone else, two step, one step or same answer, I guess. <laughs> same answer. <laughs> yeah, I would say mine's pretty similar. So. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I, I want to switch. So I, I want to try and keep us out of here in six minutes. So I want to touch on two things real quick. I want to touch on tech. So if there's any specific tech tools that you've found recently to help you with the listing side about anything, right? Anything that we can give as a takeaway for people tech side. And I really want to touch quickly on safety, but let's start with tech. Uh, Ashley, any favorite tech tools that you've got for listings, anything to do with listings? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier Jiffy. Um, it's like the um, services app, I guess, that um, you can use and you can change the address as well. It doesn't always have to be the same address. So who, wherever you're listing, you can just send somebody to that address. And I find that helpful. Um, in addition to that, um, I use Canva a lot as well in terms of, you know, just creating marketing content. Um, I think that's a really, really great one too. Those are my top two. Kelsey, favorite tech? Oh, it's Canva. I am like the least tech savvy person you'll ever meet. And I'm very, I do my business very old school. So um, Canva has been a saving grace for me these last few years, for sure. Justin, go for it. Um, I use Asana for my listing checklist. And that's been a huge um, help in making sure that no steps get missed. Um, yeah, that's, it, I looked for years and years and years for a really good checklist, uh, software. Um, and that one to me is like the biggest tech that is like that I use in my business every single day. So can, can you just explain a little bit, just dive, dive a little deeper into it. Yeah. So basically I have like, I have a very dialed in listing process that I've built over the years, but basically like every step that's in there, whether it's like when to get the MLS signed, you know, have I coordinated staging, have I coordinated photo photography have i sent that welcome email have i sent the congratulations your um you know your listing is live email um all of those like really um, important steps are in there uh, and the one thing that i really love about asana is that you can um write in the body like when you click on the task you can copy and paste like that email template 
right into uh, right into that task. So it really makes things very streamlined and automated, and you're delivering that exact same experience over and over again. And I think that's you know what's important, especially with listings, is to make that process um, automated, but also very like um, like replicatable. Because then you can really sometimes I bring that spreadsheet of all those tasks to my listing presentation to be like, here are the like you know 102 steps that we do. Basically, when you break everything down, it looks like a lot more work. And then, you know, to go back to those value uh, questions too, when they can physically see what all your steps are in their listings, they're not going to go private. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's let's switch it. We I want I want to end us in three minutes. So we, I, but I really want to chat about safety. Um, you know, going into someone's home to list their property, they've called us. What what can we give some takeaway tips or some must dos moving forward? about safety when we're visiting someone else's home and we're going to do some listings. Uh, Kelsey? Uh, social media, number one, you make sure you search, see if they're there. Um, I mean, I'm from Thunder Bay, so it's a small town. So usually everybody knows a variation of somebody. Um, another thing I do is I Google their name because if they're a criminal or something, their name is going to pop up on Google. Um, if I ever feel uncertain or unsure of where I'm going, or I don't know someone who knows the person, I'll be likely to bring somebody with me. Um, I always use an example of, I had my car broken into like my second year of real estate and for, yeah. And I left my purse like a dumb dumb in the car um, and they stole everything. And I was nervous to be in that area uh, for a while. And I was kind of made an example of with all these other agents in our city. And for the longest time, if I had to show a house in that area, a realtor friend of mine, he actually parked his car behind mine while I was showing the houses or down the street. Uh, if you ever feel unsure, another thing too is, well, locations on your phone or even Apple tags for people to, you know, keep tabs on you just and always tell somebody if you're uncertain and you don't want to bring someone with you, um, tell people where you're going. And if they don't hear from you from a certain time, then check in. I think also too, having a qualifying Zoom call before as well, uh, so you can put a face to the name. It doesn't always mean it's going to be 100% safe, but going with someone as well, right? Like find a colleague, find someone, um, say they're your assistant, do what you need to do, right? And just kind of uh, bring someone along. I know safety is is a big thing. Um, and I get a little bit worried going places as well. So um, find someone that you know you can bring and you can go with them as well. That's that is my recommendation. Ashley, any, any kind of tips or things that you do specifically to, to, for safety? Yeah, I, I do all of the above. I'll, I'll try to, you know, have a face-to-face -face Zoom or something with them first. Um, I'll usually also check Geo Warehouse to make sure they are the owner. <laughs> um, and that certainly helps because then you know the full name and whatnot. And then I'll usually share my uh, location to, you know, whoever on, on WhatsApp. Um, and, and then people can keep track of my every move and then they'll know if I don't respond and however long they'll, they'll know to contact me. Justin. Yeah. The, like, especially out in the country properties, when I'm going out there alone, I, like, I'll, I still share my, uh, I still share my, uh, location as well. So I think that's probably the biggest one, at least then, you know, whoever I'm sharing with knows exactly sort of where I am in case anything happens and I don't come back home. Yeah. The, the one thing I, I was always told was even, you know, and Kelsey kept, kept saying if, if I was feeling unsure, if I was, wasn't feeling kind of, you know, uneasy going into it. Um, but we keep getting reminded now, especially with all when we hear about these stories that we should make these a daily or a regular practice, not just when we don't feel, you know, because bad people are bad people regardless. So, um, OK, one last tip and we're going to end it on that that you want someone to take away about working with first time home sellers. Uh, Justin, one last takeaway. Honestly, not nothing that I haven't said before, but just like, seriously, just make the experience about them. That's all I will. That's my big tidbit. And my big sort of takeaway would be just like, make, make the experience about them. I mean, even when you're dealing with buyers too, but especially with sellers, they'll tell you everything that you need to know that to, to make the experience uh, towards them for sure. Ashley. Uh, yeah, um, I would say communicate, over communicate, just really keep 
uh, keep the client uh, informed as to what's going on with the market, with their listing, with, with all of that. And I think um, they'll be put at ease. Georgia. Yeah, patience um, and understanding. Make sure you walk them through every little detail. But yeah, over communicate would be mine as well. <laughs> There's a theme. There's a theme here. There's a theme. Kelsey. <laughs> Validate their feelings and make sure you include them in everything. Um, it's an exciting process and you want them to be over the moon about it and tell all their friends and family about how great it was. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone today for sharing your experience and your knowledge with everyone on the call. Um, please, everyone, look these people up on Instagram, look them up on Facebook, check out their websites, reach out to them. If you see them at the ARIA event, YPN event that's happening at Reality, because you're all going to buy tickets and we're all going to go because it's going to be an amazing time. Um, you know, please walk up to them, say hi, introduce yourselves. The, these people love what they do. They love talking about real estate. Please reach out to them, you know, send them DMs, send them messages of praise and thanks, tag them, take screenshots, tag them. These guys deserve to be shouted from the rooftops. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you uh, panelists for being here today. And we look forward to, I'm not sure if we're going to have the next one before the reality white piano event, but make sure you get your ticket. It's going to be a really fun time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Matt. That was awesome today. Thanks, Bye. Matt.